In my real life, people know me as a pigtail gal, and sometimes the pigtails are underneath the bandana. Like that's how I get my hair up, is I, I tuck the pigtails up and then I bandana them up. So today, I just thought, you know, we're doing pie. We're in my happy place. Let's make it a pigtail day. And look how bouncy they are. They're bouncing and behaving. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this episode of Bake It Up A Notch. I'm Erin Jean McDowell and in this episode I am tackling the most commonly asked questions I get about three of the most popular pies that we make around the fall holidays. Of course I'm talking about pumpkin, pecan, and apple. Rather than taking you step by step through specific recipes in this episode, I want to give you tips that you can use with any recipe you're making. If you're looking for a place to get started, we've listed some of Food 52's favorite recipes in the video description below, so you can head there. Get ready to up your game on an old family favorite, or try a brand new recipe with total confidence. And don't forget, for all the pie tips, you'll wanna check out the four-part Pie Spectacular episodes of Bake It Up A Notch, and my best-selling cookbook, The Book on Pie. It has absolutely everything you need to know. This is gonna be a lot of fun and I'm hungry to give you the answers, so let's get baking. Pecan pie is a type of baked custard pie, and the custard is actually also serving to bind an inclusion. In this case, the inclusion is the pecans themselves. The custard sort of falls in all those nooks and crannies between the nuts to bind them into something beautiful, sliceable, and delicious. Pecan pies are also a single crust pie, and in my opinion, all single crust pies should be par-baked. As you know, I am a vehement member of the anti-soggy bottom brigade, and we really wanna make sure that we have a crisp, beautiful golden brown crust that is all the way baked through by the time our filling is perfectly set. And what a lot of people don't realize is that it just isn't possible for the pie crust to bake all the way through in the same amount of time that it takes the filling to cook. So we've got to par bake it or partially bake it. We've got to give it a head start. As a bonus, par baking ensures that you are likely to pass the sturdy pie challenge and it also makes your pies much easier to slice. So it's truly a win, 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 win. So many wins. A lot of pecan pie recipes do not include instructions for par baking, but you can still do it and be true to the recipe. To par-bake the crust, you're gonna wanna start with your crust very well chilled in your pie plate. This has been in the refrigerator for about an hour, nice and firm, nice and cold. I docked it before I put it in the refrigerator. You can dock it with a fork after it is chilled. Once it's chilled, it's actually a little bit easier for that fork to kind of cause larger holes or tears. And we definitely don't wanna make any holes too large because our custard could end up seeping through there and end up kind of adhering our crust to the pie plate, especially in the case of pecan pie, which is basically a caramelly, delicious sort of custard. And then we need to line it with pie weights. A lot of people don't realize that the pie weights need to come all the way up to the top edge of the crust. If they don't, you're not supporting the entire crust. We're not only trying to weigh down the base of the crust so that it doesn't puff up, we're also trying to weigh down and support the sides of the crust. Sometimes people have problems where their pie crust starts to slide down in the oven during baking, and this actually is one way that you can prevent that. Having enough pie weights helps to make sure that it kind of stays in place. Keeping it really cold is the other thing you need to do. When in doubt, chill it out. Pie loves to be cold, we know this. So I've got a piece of parchment paper, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna crumple it up. And then I'm gonna press that into my pie dish. Crumpling it up just makes it more flexible and easy for it to go into our pie shell. At home, I have a large collection of these. They are ceramic pie weights, and they are my favorite because they are really heavy. They look pretty in a jar on my shelf. I like using them. But we would need two of these containers to properly fill this particular pie pan I have in front of me. So today I'm gonna use what you can also use if you don't have beautiful ceramic pie weights. You can use just dried beans, dried grains, anything like that. And again, we wanna make sure we fill it all the way to the top edge. Depending on the size of your pie plate, you'll need 
about two to three pounds of dried beans or grains to fill up to the top. I like to bake my pies and par bake and blind bake and do all of those things on a parchment lined baking sheet just to catch any drips that might happen in the oven. You don't have to line it with parchment if you don't want to. You can just put it on a baking sheet, but it also makes it easier to pull it in and out of the oven. I'm gonna put this onto a baking sheet and I'm going to put it into the oven at 425 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 to 17 minutes until the top edge starts to brown lightly. After that initial bake, it's going to be time to take out the pie weights. I like to take some kind of heat safe bowl over by the oven so I can just do this as quickly as possible and they don't have to travel too far. And if it looks like it might be puffing up anywhere, I might just hit it a few more times with the tines of a fork or the tip of a paring knife just to make a few more spots for that steam to escape during the remainder of baking. Then it goes back into the oven for two to three minutes more until the sides and bottom of the pie are kind of an even color. It'll be sort of a pale blonde and it should be matte in texture. So I have two par baked crusts in front of me and they are both gonna work. I'm going to use both of them, but one of these is pretty much textbook perfect and one of them actually has a couple little mistakes. On this pie, we have a really even color from both the sides and the base. And you can see it's kind of blonde in color and also sort of matte in texture. Whenever you see little darker spots on the base or sides of the pie, that's usually an indicator that it is slightly underbaked. Now remember, these are going back into the oven for a second bake. So most likely any minor imperfections like this can be solved during the second bake. But this is what I'm trying to avoid is any darker spots like this. Also, this particular pie got a little bit darker around the edge than this one. This is more what I like to see at the end of par baking is just a little bit of light brown around this edge. This one is getting a little bit dark for me. So when that happens, they do make different kind of pie shields out of silicone and metal. You can use those, or you can just use aluminum foil to sort of tent the sides and edges of your pie crust. Remember, there are so many more details about all of this process in the Pie Crust 101 episode of Bake It Up A Notch, and you're gonna wanna check it out. After par baking, be sure to cool your crust completely before you add your filling. Okay, this next one is such a simple tip, but it is such an important one. A lot of recipes for pecan pie have you mix in the pecans into your custard. Then when you pour it in, you can just get this kind of wacky distribution of pecans where you get one piece that has a lot, one piece that's maybe more custard. So there's a very simple solution to this. Just put the pecans in first. I'm gonna pour the pecans into my par baked pie shell. It's cooled completely and I'm gonna spread them into an even layer. And then I'll just pour my custard over it. That custard is gonna naturally go through into all the nooks and crannies and really help bind it together. This pecan pie is already ready for the oven. So just a simple little thing you can do, it takes one extra second, but totally worth it every time. One other fun thing I like to talk about with pies like this is that they are adaptable. I wanna encourage you to think of this really as a custard pie where that custard is binding some kind of inclusion. And that inclusion, of course, is commonly pecans, but why couldn't it be pistachios or walnuts or a combination of chopped chocolate and your favorite nut? You can really kind of make a recipe your own. And I think that that's important to remember, especially if someone in your life might be allergic to pecans or you love that caramelly flavor, but you're a bigger fan of almonds. So just remember, even with a favorite recipe like pecan pie, you can get kind of creative and swap it out. And while we're here, we might as well see if this passes the sturdy pie challenge. Oh wait, it does? It's almost like I already knew that. Huh? Huh? Uh? 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 Pumpkin pie is another type of custard pie, this time sans inclusions. It's just a smooth, creamy, dreamy custard. And again, because it is a baked custard pie and it's a single crust pie, pretty much all the same rules that we were just talking about with pecan pie apply here. But let's dive a little deeper and really make sure we can perfect this particular classic. Now here's something a little extra you can do, and this is the kind of thing that usually only the baker will truly notice, but I think it's fun. It's sort of a food styling trick. If you want a picture perfect surface on the top of your pie, totally smooth and absolutely beautiful, you want to call in your friend, the kitchen torch. And we love an excuse to call in this, our best friend, our baby. We love you. 
We're going to use that on the surface and the heat is gonna basically draw bubbles to the surface and also help to completely pop them. Be sure you don't spend too much time doing this. We wanna make sure that we're just using enough heat to pop the bubbles, but not so much that we're lingering any heat that could start to cook the surface of our pie. Custard pie fillings are actually one of the easiest to make. Just whisk all the ingredients together to combine. The real key to getting them just right is baking them so that they are perfectly set, silky smooth, rather than tough and rubbery. A properly set custard pie will appear set around the outside edge, but will be slightly jiggly towards the center. This is also because custard pies like this will sort of do a little bit of carry over cooking. We don't wanna bake it until it's completely set because it's going to retain some heat as it cools. That can ultimately cause the custard to crack as it begins to cool. But if we take it out a little bit before it's done, the retained heat will help finish the pie so that it is perfectly creamy and very smooth. Custard pies are typically baked at a lower temperature than you would do your par baking at, or even like pies like fruit pies are baked at. And that's because custards really enjoy being baked low and slow so that those eggs can gradually coagulate, which is going to make the smoothest custard. If we try to rush it, or if you have hot spots in your oven, you could end up with uneven textures and bad side effects like weeping when it comes out of the oven. Proper handling of custard pies doesn't end with being careful in the oven and during bake time. It's also really important that you gradually cool custard pies, especially around the holidays. I think sometimes people get pressed for time. Something comes out of the oven and they think, oh, I'll cool it down faster by putting it in the refrigerator. But taking some kind of baked custard from an intense heat to an intense cool is something else that can cause it to crack or weep. It can also cause the custard to sort of pull away from the pie crust, which can make it really messy when you go to slice it. For best results, cool your custard pie fully to room temperature before refrigerating it. Okay, you've put all my pumpkin pie tips into practice and you still have one of the worst mistakes that can happen with your pumpkin pie, a crack in the surface. <gasps> Guess what guys, mistakes happen. This is nothing gasp worthy, especially because who is eating pumpkin pie without plenty of whipped cream? So instead of allowing your guests to put on their own whipped cream, just do it for them. No one even needs to know that there is a crack. And in this particular case, we actually baked our pumpkin pie perfectly. Yesterday when it came out of the oven, it was totally smooth, really lovely, and we let it cool at room temperature as instructed. But right now, there's kind of humid weather passing through and overnight, a smallest, tiniest little crack formed. There is no shame in my pie game. I know this is still a delicious pie. It's not rubbery, it's not overbaked. And if I cover up that little crack with a few swooshes of whipped cream, no one needs to know anything at all. Fruit pies are really an animal all their own and they come with a very unique set of difficulties that can also change depending on what type of fruit you're using. So of course today we're talking about apple pie, which is such a classic come the holiday season. You can learn so much more about fruit pies in our fruit pie episode of Bake It Up A Notch. So if this just skims the surface for you, you're really gonna wanna check that one out. I'm a big believer that the best pies are sliceable. Yes, I want them to be juicy, but juice should not run out when you slice a pie. They should really hold their shape. While most varieties of baking apples really hold their shape well during baking, they also contain a lot of juice and a lot more than you may realize. The key to achieving a nice, crisp bottom crust on a fruit pie is to control the juiciness of your fruit filling. And my favorite way to do that is by pre-cooking the filling. In fact, this is one of the things that I really try to impart on people about pie. There are so many pie recipes out there that use raw fruit in the filling, and I'm a firm believer that you should really take that little bit of extra time to pre-cook it. This has other advantages around the holiday season because again, it's something you can do ahead. You can do this several days ahead and hold the prepared filling in your refrigerator. Pre-cooking helps to draw the moisture out of the fruit and also allows you to control the thickness before we even bake the pie. The goal at the end of the pre-cooking should be a glossy, juicy looking filling that's a little bit too runny because remember, it will be baked again but the idea is we've already activated some of the thickener, whether your recipe uses flour or cornstarch. By pre-cooking the filling, we've activated the thickener. That way the bake time is really just the final set to achieve that perfect sliceable piece of pie. 
You can find recipes for pre-cooked apple filling in my book on pie, or you can adjust an existing apple pie recipe that you love to pre-cook the filling. Here's how to do it. I usually start by sauteing my apples in a little bit of butter, so if your recipe contains it, you can start that way. If it doesn't, toss your apples with lemon juice or any other flavoring and a portion of the sugar, about half. Whisk the remaining sugar with the thickener you're using in the recipe. Flour, cornstarch, tapioca, whatever it is. The granules of the sugar will help to disperse the thickener as you add it to the pre-cooked filling. Once the apples have started to release some of their juices in the pot, sprinkle the sugar and thickener mixture over it and stir evenly to combine. Then continue to cook the filling, stirring frequently until it reaches that nice little bit of thickness. Again, it should still have some juiciness. You can see this is some filling that's cooling in front of me and it still kind of slides on the baking sheet because it does have that like liquid, little bit of juicy caramelliness going on. It's also important to remember that you need to cool a pre-cooked filling completely before you add it to the crust. To help this go faster, put it onto a baking sheet. The expanded surface area will help the filling cool down as quickly as possible. If your recipe uses raw apples and you wanna keep it that way, I still have a couple of tips for controlling the juiciness level of your pies. My friend and colleague, Rosalie V. Barenbaum, created this technique where you macerate the fruit for your fruit pie in a small portion of the sugar. I usually use about half of the sugar called for in the recipe. You can let it sit for several hours, at least one hour, and it will help pull moisture out of the fruit. Remember, sugar is hygroscopic, meaning it has that ability of pulling moisture out of things and helping it release. So even though we're not going to cook these apples, we're not gonna be able to control the juiciness by having a little bit of stove top time, we can control the juiciness by letting some of that moisture come out. So here I have some apples that have been macerating for a while. I'm just gonna take the apples out and put them in a separate dish and show you how much juice is left behind. All of this juice came off of these apples, which are baking apples. So they're not even as juicy as an ingredient like maybe peaches or something like that would be if you were baking. After you macerate the fruit, if there's more than a quarter cup or so of juice, you're going to want to reduce it. The idea is we can just concentrate some of the flavor. We don't wanna lose any of that flavor that's in the juice, but we do wanna lose some of the water content. So all you would need to do is put this into a small pot on the stove top, bring it to a simmer and let it simmer down until it reduces to be between two to three tablespoons in volume. Then that reduced juice can go back in with your fruit and you can proceed with the pie filling recipe as directed. One of the most common issues with apple pies is that the filling has a tendency to shrink down after baking. This means if you're making a double crust apple pie, sometimes it appears that there's a large gap or some amount of space between the top crust and where the filling begins. Now, pre-cooking actually helps alleviate this problem in a big way because we're controlling some of the moisture and also starting the cooking process before we even put the pie into the oven. But it is a little bit trickier when you're dealing with raw apples. Whether you're using a pre-cooked filling or raw apples, the key is to pack the filling into the crust as tightly as possible. Now, again, with a pre-cooked filling, this mostly just means making sure you really press it down into a firm, even layer. But with raw apples, I I kind of go the extra mile. Now again, you don't have to do this. You can just put your apple filling into the crust and bake it and you'll have a delicious pie. But this little bit of extra effort is going to make there be less of a gap. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start placing the apple slices, slightly overlapping them in concentric rings around the outside edge of the pie. I'll continue to build this into sort of a spiral and after I have one layer on the bottom, I'll build it up. What this does is it eliminates air pockets between the individual pieces of apples so that even after the pie is baked and the apples have shrunk slightly, there's less room for them to deflate. There's really nowhere for them to go. If you're looking for an easier, faster, more foolproof apple pie, I suggest skipping the top crust and going for a crumb topping instead. I love a Dutch apple pie, which is the name often given to an apple pie with streusel topping. And in my experience, it's always the first one on the table of pies to go. So it's gotten to the point where I realize I think a lot of people really prefer that crumb topping to the crust anyway. 
Plus, where a crust can kind of pose problems, the aforementioned gap between the filling and the crust, not to mention the potential for it to absorb some of the moisture from the filling and be kind of soggy itself, streusel actually absorbs the moisture in the filling in a really delicious way, where it makes some of it really moist and caramelly and more delicious, rather than kind of becoming a hindrance or being a problem. Streusel top pies also take less total time to bake than a double crust pie would. So again, it's a little bit quicker, a little bit easier, and it's always a crowd pleaser. Let's bake this streusel top pie. You're gonna see what I mean. Amanda came by for pie. <laughs> I mean, you do work here. <laughs> okay, so which is your favorite fall holiday pie? I must know, are you a pumpkin? Are you a pecan? Are you an apple? Um, I, I, you know, pumpkin. Because okay. Because okay. it's really the only time of year that you have, or at least I have pumpkin. Pie, right. So like pumpkin to... with whipped cream is that acceptable, or you want a plain pumpkin? I, I, I mean. How do you say no to whipped cream? I, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Sturdy pie challenge Ooh, first and whoa. foremost, right? Oh my god, that is so cool. This is the whole thing. If okay. we if we properly bake the pie, okay. then we can pass the sturdy pie challenge. And look, it makes it so much easier to slice it wait, too. Wait, what's the difference between the sturdy pie challenge and the anti soggy bottom challenge? They're really the same thing. I just the sturdy pie is what I call it because I really enjoy holding it like triumphantly like this. Ooh, like, can I do oh, that too? yes. Join me. Oh, wow. She's sturdy. <laughs> wow, okay. Totally okay. classic pumpkin pie. Okay. Um, and obviously we're, we got a flaky crust. I, I'm not to be a weirdo, but I have to watch you eat it because <laughs> I can't even eat my own slice. I just need to watch okay. the, the reaction. No pressure yeah, though. Kill if I, if I must. <laughs> Ooh. Mm. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> mm. It's like, it's fun to get that little bit of flakiness, but my favorite part about a good pie is when there's all that contrasting texture. This is like a cloud. And then actually <laughs> the pumpkin filling is really nice because it actually has a lot of nice moisture to it. And, but it hasn't gotten the crust all soggy. I think that that's what's so cool about this is even as a pie baker, I want to give people a great pie recipe, but also I recognize that especially around the holidays, you might already have a favorite. Mm -hmm. So no amount of me saying this is the best pumpkin pie might change your mind if you already think you have one. But even when you have right. the perfect recipe, there are still things we can do to make sure we get like, the perfect bake. Totally. This is the perfect bake. This is so good. And this is really, so what kind of, is, it, is this a butter crust? Yes, all butter, baby. Mm -hmm. On It's in the video yeah. description. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, this was super fun. <laughs> well, can I visit more often? <laughs> I know, I'm like, can we just make pie every day? Every day is Thanksgiving day. or whatever. Insert fall holiday here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Bake It Up A Notch, where I tried to give you some pro tips for three of the most popular pies in the fall, apple, pecan, and pumpkin. If you're looking for a place to start, be sure to check out the Food 52 recipes that are linked in the video description below. And if this episode does inspire you to make one of these classic pies, please use hashtag Bake It Up A Notch because I love to see what you're making in your kitchens. If you have any questions about pie, be sure to let us know in the comments so I can get in there and answer everything you need to know before the holidays come. You wanna know more about pie? You should check out one of our many delicious pie episodes. There are so many. Check it out. Bye. <laughs>